Uh, thank you for uh, joining me for today's uh, weekly COVID update, but actually a weekly update for a broad range of issues. I'm pleased to be joined by uh, Dr. Jose Romero of the Department of Health, as well as uh, Dr. Ivy Pfeffer, uh, Deputy uh, Secretary at the uh, Department of Education. And uh, let me uh, first make a comment about the ongoing developments in Afghanistan that we're all uh, watching uh, very carefully and with great heartache. Uh, that has uh, developed into a uh, military crisis, a humanitarian crisis, both at the same time. And I reflect back on my post-9-11 uh, world in which uh, we had to protect America from a, a terrorist attack and what our men and women did in Afghanistan uh, was extraordinary. Their service there for over, for right at 20 years uh, has kept our homeland much safer. And so that has to be acknowledged and that's an important fact. We also know that they uh, received the cooperation of uh, the Afghan people, uh, many of those who at great risk to themselves supported uh, the U.S. mission there in Afghanistan. And that is uh, where we come today as to we see this uh, crisis unfold and we first want to make sure that uh, all Americans uh, get out of there safely, that they have the passage that they need, the military support that they need. And uh, I, we're all praying for uh, the military operations to be successful in getting uh, Americans out of there. Contractors, uh, all the personnel that has uh, work there in service of our country. The second priority, though, should be those uh, Afghan nationals that fought alongside, trained alongside, and supported the U.S. mission. And the point I want to make today is that Arkansas uh, understands the American responsibility uh, toward those uh, families, uh, those uh, brave people that supported the United States of America and that's mission, and Arkansas uh, would welcome them as uh, part of uh, the other states that are welcoming uh, those that uh, need a place of refuge. Arkansas would certainly uh, stand in the gap there and say uh, we want to do our part and fulfill the mission and responsibility that America has toward uh, those families. Uh, with that, uh, let me uh, shift to today's focus on uh, COVID-19 and I want to start with the uh, case report, uh, which is uh, sadly uh, broke uh, any trend that was developed in the last uh, three days where we had a downward trend in cases. But today you see we have 3,549 uh, new cases. And uh, in, in talking with the Department of Health, uh, it certainly uh, some of these are coming from the schools. Uh, and we will get more information as to the numbers, but uh, that is one of the reasons for the spike, which is not necessarily unexpected, but we're hoping uh, that uh, that kind of spike would not happen. Active cases are up, as you can see. Uh, deaths, sadly, have increased by 16 as a result of uh, COVID-19. And then uh, in terms of the hospitalizations, we have 38 uh, newly hospitalized and uh, five new additional on ventilators. Uh, in terms of the vaccinations, uh, the vaccinations are at 8,776, not as high as it has been in uh, recent days. Uh, hopefully uh, that will kick back up because I liked uh, the vaccinations when they're around 10,000 a day, but uh, it's hard to sustain that, uh, partly probably because we had a rush of uh, students getting vaccinated prior to school. Now that they're in school, uh, we don't want to lose our focus on uh, increasing those uh, students that are vaccinated as well, those that are over 12. Uh, so as you can see, we're still dealing with this. Whenever you look at Washington County with 466 new cases, Garland County with 262, uh, those are uh, really high numbers for those communities and we will uh, delve into those more carefully. And then if we go to the next one. Uh, it reemphasizes the points that have been made, but this is very, very important as we continue to increase 
uh, the emphasis on vaccinations. If you look at the chart, we, the data since February shows that of all the cases, 91% of COVID cases were in individuals that were not fully vaccinated. If you look at the second uh, graph, you see that of the hospitalizations uh, since February 1st, 92.6% of hospitalizations were in individuals that were not fully vaccinated. And then finally, you can see uh, on the deaf side that 91.46% uh, of the deaths were in individuals that were not fully vaccinated as well. And so uh, now let's come back though, and it, these statistics that we see both the increase the number of cases as well as uh, the, the statistics that vaccination is your best path to avoiding hospitalization or serious consequences from this. And so we're continuing that emphasis on vaccinations. Uh, we did have news last week, of course, that the FDA authorized uh, and recommended doses of COVID-19 vaccinations for uh, those that are moderately or severely immune, immunocompromised individuals. And so that is present now, that booster shot is available for those that fit within that definition. We also know that in uh, coming weeks, uh, the HHS has a, uh, approved and announced that they're waiting on FDA review, uh, but they will are recommending that there be a booster shot for everyone that uh, uh, is susceptible to getting the vaccination. And so we are currently developing plans to implement that strategy, even though we're not ready to do that yet. We're working with our pharmacists, our hospitals, and making sure that we will have the vaccines. Colonel Ader is here, who uh, has uh, started developing the plans for the implementation of that a third booster shot as we get more information. And then uh, let me go to our school situation. Uh, first of all, as we indicated last week, uh, we plan, we have implemented and we have delivered now a high filtration mask have been sent out to all the children across the state. Uh, and that includes over 500,000 high filtration masks are being sent to the schools. Uh, that should be delivered this week, and that includes specifically 325,000 that are designed for children's masks. We continue our vaccination emphasis with Stop the Hesitation, Get the Vaccination uh, campaign, and uh, that is in full swing. And then I want to take a second to applaud our school boards and our school leadership across the state of Arkansas. Uh, as a result of Judge Fox's ruling, uh, they have the opportunity to make their own decision on their local school district as to uh, following the CDC and Department of Health guidelines on masks uh, in the schools. And of the 260, 262 school districts, 118 have adopted a mask policy, and that covers a majority of the students in Arkansas. 87 have chosen not to adopt a policy and 57 have taken no formal action. It also looks at the university systems with the U of A and ASU systems adopting a mass policy as well as Arkansas Tech University and University of Central Arkansas. And so what we see is that uh, school districts are weighing this decision very carefully. They're listening to people and they're making a judgment based upon what they see as the best public health outcome for the students in their district. To me, uh, they have uh, served well, they have taken on that responsibility, and they have represented their districts. And I know that will be ongoing, and they'll continue to review that, but I wanted to applaud the school boards and the leadership for the work they've done. Finally, uh, according to the CDC, we do now have 51.2% of Arkansas's total population uh, at least partially vaccinated. Now, we didn't meet that goal by July 30th, but we have met that goal. According to CDC statistics, we want to continue to increase that uh, because that will bring us 
ultimately the relief that we want. And with that, I'll invite uh, Dr. Romero for his comments, uh, followed by Dr. Pfeffer. Thank you, Governor. Um, I want to limit my comments today to the booster doses that um, have been uh, already approved by uh, FDA and CDC, and those are for immunocompromised individuals that have moderate to severe immunocompromised. Uh, I'm encouraging them uh, to become vaccinated, to get their, their booster doses. Um, they can receive that at, at any pharmacy or at a local health unit or with their primary care providers or their subspecialists if they have them. With regard to the uh, latest um, recommendation or by uh, HHS to, uh, for booster doses in the general population, we are awaiting, as the governor mentioned, uh, FDA and its ACIP uh, approval of the vaccine and, and policy recommendations for the use of those vaccines. Uh, those that currently uh, apply primarily to, primarily to individuals that have received either the Pfizer vaccine or the Moderna vaccine. Decisions for the booster doses uh, for the Janssen vaccine have not been issued yet uh, and will be forthcoming after that. We see that there will be a need uh, to reach out uh, to populations that we uh, made special efforts to reach out to in the initial uh, phase of vaccination. We will be reaching out to them again. <clears throat> this will probably be a phased approach as, as uh, uh, given the fact that we addressed high risk populations such as those individuals living in long term congregate settings first, they will receive their vaccines first. I want to make it very clear that the recommendation is that individuals not receive their booster until eight months after the second dose. And there's a reason for that, which we'll discuss in coming weeks. But right now, we don't believe that everybody needs a booster immediately. And this will be a phased approach as we rolled out the vaccine. And I'll stop here and turn it back over to the governor. Thank you very much. Excuse me, to Dr. Pfeffer. Thank you, Dr. Romero and Governor. Um, I'm happy to be here with you today. Um, we want to report that we have had a smooth start to the school year. Um, some may say that it's been smoother than what they expected. But we really want to credit that to the fact that our schools are ready. Um, they've done a tremendous amount of planning, a lot of communication, and we also want to credit the cooperation that they are getting from their parents and from their communities. Um, at, according to our data, all schools are open, and we do not have any school or district-wide modifications reported at this time. Um, we know that that could change in the future, but what we um, know right now is that the number of disruptions is significantly lower in many schools um, in spite of some of the positive cases, and that's due to the, the number of vaccinations that both staff and students have received, and also because several of our school districts have implemented mask requirements, which also cut down on the number of quarantines. Um, I want to highlight some of the school districts in how they're reporting information to parents to help people better understand not just the situation in the schools, but also how they impact students and staff regarding quarantines. Uh, the Cabot School District has created a new data dashboard that not only shows their um, numbers each day by school, it also shows the number of students that are not having to quarantine um, as a result of um, either vaccination or um, mask wearing. Um, I know the Marion School District is also providing this level of detail to their parents. And it's important for that communication to be ongoing so that parents understand situations with their children, their classrooms. Um, but it's also important to note that when schools implement layers of uh, mitigation strategies, that is what is um, safer for students and also going to prevent um, a lot of the disruptions that occur. Um, we do um, want to also recognize that the vaccination clinics in many school districts are continuing across the state. Some of the examples that um, I know of are in the Rogers School District. Uh, within the last week, they held a vaccination clinic and vaccinated over 106 individuals, most of those were students. Texarkana School District has recently had a vaccination clinic with 149 people being vaccinated there. 
And last Saturday, the Earl School District had 59 students who were vaccinated. So these are just ongoing um, evidence of um, how important schools are um, taking the um, strategies that they know will promote safety and promote continuous learning. Um, and I, finally, I just want to leave with a comment in talking to a group yesterday. Um, I asked what were they pleased with so far. And um, this was from a group in the southeast part of the state where a lot of students were virtual last year, but have chosen to come back on site this year. And the superintendent said, we're probably most delighted to have full parking lots and um, traffic, a lot of traffic around our schools. And I can't help but think that just a short time ago, parking, full parking lots and congested traffic lines were probably some of the biggest headaches that um, school people would have um, cited. But my, how our perspective changes. And if anything, I hope that we are more appreciative of the numbers of students, the numbers of parents that can be engaged with us in teaching and learning. And um, I just want to commend all of our schools for the efforts that they've made and know that we'll be here to continue to support you. Thank you. Thank you, Ivy. With that, we'll take any questions. I wanted to ask you two questions. First of all, there, the lawsuit that was filed against the uh, Bentonville School District challenging their mask, uh, mask mandate. I want to see if you had any reaction to that, including the argument that they're making that the school board there did not have the authority to impose that mandate. Uh, secondly, I wanted to see if you or Dr. Romero could talk about uh, the contact tracing efforts and how, how they're going and how much of a challenge is that going to be with keeping track of cases in schools right now? Uh, first, on the question in reference to the Bentonville uh, lawsuit, uh, I haven't seen that, uh, but uh, it looks to me like that uh, from a litigation standpoint, this will wind up in the Arkansas Supreme Court for a decision, and uh, that will come uh, based upon uh, the appeal from the decision of Judge Fox, or it could be from one of the other courts, so I expect that to be uh, finally answered uh, by that uh, court, and uh, we'll just have to wait on that. In, in my judgment, uh, uh, you know, the uh, law that was passed uh, has constitutional challenges, and that's what Judge Fox found, and uh, that uh, gave uh, authority back to the local school districts to uh, make that determination, as they have done uh, uh, very prudently across Arkansas. And in reference to your second question, Dr. Romero, did you want to do that, or Renee? On the case investigation and the contact tracing, um, our contractors are working diligently to um, keep up with the numbers that are coming in. You know, we scaled down at the time um, when the numbers started going down. So they're in the process now of hiring new people, training new people, but they're able to keep up pretty well, pretty well right now. So. booster shots, are you expecting even more hesitancy trying to get Arkansans to get a third shot when it's already been difficult to get the first and second? Uh, my answer to that is that I think whenever it's opened up for the uh, booster shot that you will have a very large number of people who will want that. Uh, I, it'll probably start with uh, the elderly population. I think you're going to see uh, the doctors and teachers that will want uh, that booster shot. Uh, I don't. Uh, those that made the decision to get the vaccination are not going to decide. Well, we don't want the booster shot. Then I think it'll just simply be uh, those that uh, have not even begun to be the vaccination process that uh, will still uh, have that same opinion. Dr. Romero, do you want? Okay. The uh, connection with the schools. You mentioned that. Um, you know, we had a big increase in cases, and that's probably related to schools. Since classes just started on Monday, is that due to preparations that were happening, at, you know, ahead of the school year? And also, um, 
if we're going to see this escalation in cases, is there are there other measures that you're considering taking to increase the hospital capacity? Uh, you know, first, it, it, we're still going to have to look at this more deeply, and the reason that uh, I'm, it looks like some of the increase in cases were coming from the schools is because you can tell how they're submitted. We have a very good system as to the schools submit the data uh, into our red cap system and where we tabulate it then, but they actually submit the data so we can see where a lot of the data is being submitted. And that's the basis for it. I don't think that uh, means, and Dr. Romero might want to address this, but that uh, there's been an outbreak in any school. I think this is just um, uh, the natural flow of, of, we're still in our first week of school, so we haven't got into a school spike yet because it usually takes a little bit longer than that. Uh, the second part of your question was on hospital space, and uh, we are, We've already taken steps to bring on additional hospital capacity. Uh, right now we have 17, is that right? What's the number of ICU beds? 23, sir. Excuse me, 23. So if you will remember, last week it got down to eight available ICU beds. We've gradually increased that up to 23. And so this is progress and we expect more to come online. Uh, in the coming days, as well as some of our med surge uh, beds as well. So we did the advanced planning and preparation and the legislature appropriated the money that we needed to increase that hospital space. So in the near future, uh, I'm hoping that we'll be in good shape. In terms of the children's uh, hospital and children's care, they're still about the same capacity as there has been. So we're, we still have available children's bed as well. Dr. Romero, I don't mean to, this is your area a little bit. Thank you. No, what the governor has said is correct with regard to beds and the availability of the children's beds. Uh, we are, they show that they have availability today. With regard to the outbreaks in schools, we've not seen a particular district have an outbreak. There was one of the earlier uh, schools that uh, opened did have an increase, but across the board at this time, we have no single district or school that's showing an outbreak. We believe that this is a, just a general increase overall. For Colonel Ader, but is the state putting in a large order of vaccines in, prepare, in preparation for the booster shots? Come on, Dr. Ader, I think, Dr. Ader, you've graduated. Do that, Colonel. <laughs> so over the last three weeks, we've, we've submitted almost 200,000 uh, 200, doses ordered. You know, over the last seven days, we ordered just under 100,000 at 99. Um, really where we sit right now for, you know, for the potential of the immunocompromised as well as the, a, a booster shot, what we expect to, uh, is that we have right now in the state about 3.4 weeks worth of supply. At our peak, at our highest point throughout the entire vaccination program, we've only given out about about a two-week supply. So we're well positioned to be able to handle any kind of uh, uh, you know transigents you know that 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 would come up. So w we were in a good spot, and I think uh, we will be ordering as we go. But I don't expect us to be, be making a large order. variant is now in the U.S. Should our Kansans be concerned about it? Well, we have enough to be concerned about with the Delta variant. Uh, and so we're still studying the Lambda variant, but I think uh, Dr. Romero should comment on that. So uh, as mentioned previously, um, the, the Lambda variant has been identified here in the state. We are tracking to see if we're seeing more cases uh, or more isolations of that particular variant. I don't think that, they, that we need to be concerned about it at this time. We are vigilant um, and will continue to be so with regard to this and other variants. It, and just one other thing, it's, it's, it's another reason why we need to be vaccinated, right? We need to get those vaccination numbers up. And I don't know whether we have anybody remotely today or not. Good afternoon, Governor. Good afternoon. Are we concerned about school districts that have not enacted mask requirements for inside school districts? And when do we expect to see some changes compared to those districts that do have mask requirements? You know, the 
uh, what I've always advocated is uh, local decisions on this point. Uh, and uh, they've made decisions, and every school district is in a different position, some more rural, uh, some with low cases, and so uh, they are making their individual decisions. I've actually been very uh, impressed with the diligence in which the school boards are considering this issue. Uh, there will be an ability to compare districts and uh, the cases that come out of those districts, and so uh, as time goes on, there'll be more information related to uh, comparing them or uh, seeing how uh, the cases progress in the different school districts. Next question. All right. Yes, ma'am. Parents who are concerned and worried after seeing some COVID cases at their kids' school for the first week. Uh, the message to parents is. Uh, to understand, as they do, how important in-classroom instruction is and how committed the teachers are to having both a good educational environment but also an uh, environment in which uh, the students' health are protected. And so uh, that's the reason that uh, we're supplying masks. And so whether the school uh, uh, you know, has a mask requirement or not, masks should be available. Uh, for that uh, child, uh, and it's a uh, high filtration mask, and so that uh, should give them confidence in that environment. And then, uh, of course, if the child is uh, over 12, get that child vaccinated. Uh, hopefully that's the case, but that is the best protection that you can provide for that child. Can you speak on uh, school districts and testing? Is that something they're doing on site or sent home? If they're sick, are they sent home, they're gonna get tested and then results present to the school? And also, will there be weekly testing within school districts or is that something that's on the table for future purposes? The test, and it's a great question and the testing is uh, under discussion. Right now, uh, you know, if somebody is exposed, they get tested many times in the school environment. Uh, sometimes they get that test uh, in home and we're looking at that issue. But uh, Ivy, do you want to make a comment on that or Dr. Merrill, anything further? So last year we did have some districts that um, participated in uh, the Binax and um, BD Verito testing um, through the school year. Um, the Department of Health, we, we are, um, as the governor said, talking with the Department of Health about the possibility for um, those testing options to be expanded. Um, right now, if a student is a probable close contact and meets the requirements for quarantine, there are a different number of days depending on whether or not they develop symptoms. Um, if they remain symptom free and have a negative test, they can return to school earlier. And so we realize that. Um, if those tests are available to those parents in an easier format, possibly at school, that will just help get students back to school more quickly. Um, just something even too on an earlier question to help maybe um, decision makers as they're thinking about things. Uh, one of the superintendents told me that last year in her school, they had over 16,000 days of student quarantines. And so um, her case to her board was, we need to do everything we can in order to minimize this. So issues like testing, if, if that provides um, information that would allow a student to come back earlier, that can also be an important part of um, continuing that teaching and learning and making sure that those students have that opportunity for in-person instruction to the maximum extent possible. Andrew, I think you've got the last question. The uh, Biden administration, I understand, has raised the possibility of states that are banning mass man mandates by schools, the possibility of, of them facing civil, civil rights uh, you know, lawsuits over that from, from the administration. Have you gotten any kind of communication like that from the Biden administration? And even with the law here blocked, does that raise any concerns about Arkansas's ban? I have not had any communication from the Biden administration on that issue. Uh, we'll see how it develops. Uh, you know, the steps that they've taken thus far are uh, uh, 
making it a requirement for nursing home staff to be vaccinated. That's uh, something that's on the table and I believe is uh, uh, moving forward as an option. Uh, I think we have to be careful whether we're a state or a federal government in, uh, in, in those type of uh, uh, punitive measures uh, to push, whether it's a vaccine or to uh, require masks. Uh, I don't think that's good for governors or for uh, the federal government. There are some exceptions to it. Uh, and I know that's uh, what's being looked at in the Biden administration and as well as among governors, but I've not had any specific conversations with them. All right, with that, thank you all very much uh, for today, and we will see you soon.